Okay, so Pi News episode 27, and uh, first up is uh, Story in Tech Radar Pro, and this is a tablet by a company called Chipsy, and uh, as you can see here, uh, it's got quite a chunky bezel on it, um, so it looks a bit like uh, maybe original iPad. You can see here that it's based on a command module 4 with 2 gig of RAM, 16 gig of storage. So it has a 2 watt speaker, microphone, 3.5 mil audio jack. It also has the ability to support a 4G module and a front facing camera as well. Uh, on the back of it, it also has visa mount screws so you can mount it on a stand. So for commercial use, that could be quite interesting. Um, so if we go to the official site, you can see here, uh, maybe if we get the black one, it will look a bit better on this picture. Uh, and then on the back, we have uh, the visa mounts here. And uh, they've got drop down options, so pre-installed OS. At the moment, it's just Debian and uh, colors black or white. There's the 4G module, uh, which is $64, and then a base stand, and all the specs and everything are there. This is the sort of thing I'm more interested in. So the command module 4 is like a stripped down version of the Pi 4 that doesn't have all the connections, and so then the idea is to add it, and this is the, the whole idea of the command module 4, that a board is made for it to give it all the breakouts and change the form factor and everything, and you can see all the connectivity on the back there. And there's a manual on the site if you want to look at any more in information on it. And you can see industrial pie brochure, so for commercial use. I didn't see anything about battery, power input, current 12 volt. Yeah, it doesn't look like it comes with a battery, so it's kind of a tablet. Maybe there's going to be a battery thing that comes in the future. Or maybe it's something I've missed. Next up is uh, a broken Raspberry Pi 4, uh, and it's just interesting because you can see what's under the heat spreader. Uh, so you can see here, I don't, I couldn't get what had happened to it, why it's all full on scratched up. It's like something's gone over it, but it, but it's weird how many scratches are going across it. But you can see the uh, the processor is there, and uh, you can see that it's it's properly been snapped in half. But looking at the information, I don't think they. There wasn't an awful lot. There were some quite witty comments about how it could be fixed. Oh, it is in there. So I didn't see this before. Uh, so kind, kind of how I figured it would look, but I really wanted to know how this happened. Well, it was already dead from sitting in a Raspberry Pi supercomputer for half a year. I just thought it'd be a cool experiment to open it up. And then someone's put, with a lawnmower, uh, a clamp, and a hammer, for your information. <laughs> okay, so that's how, that's how it's come apart. Next up is from the official Raspberry Pi blog, uh, and this is a Star Wars arcade cabinet that they've covered. Uh, so these are super rare and worth loads and loads of money. Uh, so the person who's done this decided to make their own one. And you can see there's some nice pictures of the inside, which I always like. And the interesting bit was the, uh, the control bit. And uh, it says here somewhere, yeah, the Atari yoke is considered the holy grail of controllers, and again, it's very hard to find. My prayers were answered in October 2018 with a thread on a forum I was subscribed to popped up with a small Utah-based startup aiming to supply replica yokes at a realistic price. So uh, it's amazing that the amount of energy people put into these, but it is very, very impressive. Interesting read, and as always, there'll be links in the description. So next up is this uh, Tron Tribute, and this is another arcade cabinet. And uh, I'll play, well, let's pause it, get it full screen, rather than play the video, because you can always, I'll link to the video anyway. But it's got multiple screens on it. It's full of LED lights, and it runs from a Raspberry Pi. So uh, really, really impressive. You can see there's a controller there. As you can see, it flashes and, and just looks... I mean, the amount of work that must have gone in that. And look on the ceiling there. It looks like it's projecting onto the ceiling as well. There are more pictures on this story. So if I, if I go back, yes, yeah, so it's based on a Raspberry Pi 4. And there's various different pictures of there. And you can see there's uh, this screen at the top, screen at the bottom, screens on the side. And as you can see from this original mock-up, it has changed a lot over time. Next up is the Raspberry Pi Pico story. And this is Tetris, but it's a two-player online game of Tetris. So it says here, finding someone to play Game Boy Tetris with 30 years later isn't as easy, so a clever hacker has upgraded the handheld with online multiplayer, letting players all around the world compete with each other. And there's even a battle royale mode. As you can see here from the bottom, the approach not only allows two players on either side of the world to play Tetris against each other using the original Game Boy hardware, but also a large group of players to compete 
in a sort of Tetris battle royale. Given how little data has to be shared back and forth, as players fill their screen, they're eliminated from the game one by one until the last one standing is declared the winner. Amazing. Next up uh, was a from a comment on uh, this video that I did. Uh, was it last? Yeah, last Pi News, Pi News episode 26. And it was this one here from Peter Jander. Uh, Please do a video review and speed comparison on UU Gear Raspberry Key. Now, I hadn't really heard of this, but it has been out for a little while. Uh, I looked into it, and EMMC, I, I remember having a Windows 10 EMMC laptop, and it was awful. But compared to an SD card for an operating system, it should be faster, and uh, as it says here, it should have a longer lifespan. So depending on your project, this might be something you're interested in. So in the end, uh, they'd said uh, it's small, it should have a longer life than micro SD, higher random speed, also sequential. For me, it's a big factor, it's so small. So I figured I'd have a look at it, so I've ordered one, uh, and I'll do a speed test when I get it through. Uh, and the website, you can see that it looks like this. I ordered the 16 gig one, uh, which, oh well, they actually look exactly the same. There's, uh, it tells you how to tell the difference between the two. Um, but uh, I thought it'd be interesting to try it and see how it was. It looks like um, early on people had trouble with it, uh, and it was, it's almost like it treats it like USB boot. It doesn't treat it like an SD card, um, but it'll be interesting to find out uh, how it works uh, and sort of play around with it. But it also comes with Raspbian pre-installed uh, and it says also provide some tools to make setting Wi-Fi connection and enabling SSH login much easier. So yeah, it will be interesting. You can see it's there in a Pi Zero, but I'm probably going to be using it mostly in my Pi 4. I bought it from Pi Hut. I think I paid £24, so more of that in the future. Now a story from Tom's Hardware, and uh, this is how to turn a rotary phone, uh, so a traditional phone, into a Google Assistant with Raspberry Pi. And uh, this is using, I think it's a Pi Zero, yeah, Pi Zero. But the interesting thing about it is uh, you actually pick up the phone to use Google Assistant. Uh, so yeah, nice project that, and uh, they fully integrated it into it, and there's some, again, some good photos in this. Uh, which shows some of the wiring. goes right through the setup as well, so if you're interested in doing... Uh, I might look at Google Assistant or Alexa. It's not something I've covered before, um, but uh, yeah, I might look at it in the future, and here you go. So the original wiring has been used to, uh, to work through that. Very, very interesting. And next up is... Uh, so I can't remember if it was this story, but I saw a story on this, uh, and it's basically Half-Life, uh, which actually works really well on the Raspberry Pi. I've got videos showing it working at over 100 frames per second, the PC version. But this is a never-released Dreamcast version, uh, and Dreamcast works particularly well on the Raspberry Pi 4. And uh, so I've, I've got it, and I've tried it out, and uh, it's not as good as the PC version, but it's something different to try. Um, so you can see this is a story from uh, September 2000, but if we go to the Wikipedia, uh, it tells you that on June the 16th, 2001, four days after the release of Blue Shift, Sierra announced that it had cancelled the Dreamcast port, citing changing market conditions. So it never saw the light of day, and uh, so I thought it would be interesting to try and find it. It was very easy to find, uh, but obviously I can't put any links in here. Uh, so let's start up RetroPie because we're in Twister OS, and so we have that ability. I've already put it in the right place, and as you can see, Dreamcast is the only game I've got on this particular one. So I've installed from Experimental in RetroPie the ReDream emulator, and you can see it here. So let's hit start. Uh, but also, if I press the home button, I can go to my uh, save point. Here we go. So load. And. The buttons are weird. The Dreamcast controller only has a left analog stick, as you can see from the illustration on the left-hand side there. So the green, red, yellow, and blue buttons are move forwards and backwards. Uh, you, can, you can change it, but it, but it's still none of them were controls that I particularly wanted to use, although you can completely customize it. Um, so you probably could play around with it, but as this isn't as good a version as uh, the PC version, I didn't bother. And it's a bit scratchy on the audio but it does it moves all right and it's just it's just interesting to see a game that didn't didn't meet the light of day but actually would have been I'm sure would have been popular but then I don't know if the Dreamcast was in its demise at that point and it had these loading screens which you don't get on the PC version so maybe it's just that sort of jarring bit that sort of sets it back 
there, there must be loads of reasons that it didn't come out. But yeah, it seems to work pretty well. And if I quit out of that, I'll just show you. The, the great thing about Twister is, uh, is how easy it is to go back and forth between RetroPie. And let's exit out. And the location of the ROM is in the RetroPie folder. So Home, Pi, RetroPie, ROMs. And it's labeled Dreamcast, as you can see here. And this is the ROM. Uh, it came zipped. I just had to unzip it and put it in that folder. And it worked fine. Um, but also, if I go back into RetroPie, I needed to go into RetroPie, RetroPie Setup, Manage Packages, Manage Experimental Packages, and uh, go down to Redream, and uh, you can see mine's installed, but you click on that, and then you'd click on Install. That would install the, the relevant Dreamcast packages, and then once you've got that ROM in the right place, and you reboot RetroPie, it will show up. And last up, so yesterday's video was this little USB tester, uh, which tests the amount of power that's being taken by a USB device. Now I had figured I'd put it online with the power adapter uh, and see how much power it takes to power up the Pi. Actually, I need to plug in an HDMI, otherwise it's not gonna start up properly. Um, but uh, the only thing about it is that the device is only USB 2. And so in yesterday's video, it was a bit restrictive. And so when I was using the M.2 drive uh, and anything else that uses USB 3, because it was going through USB 2, it possibly wasn't showing as much power as it was using, or it wasn't working to its full potential. So I maybe need to get something different to this. The issue is that if you're plugging something in these USB sockets, there's not a lot of room on the Pi. And a lot of these devices have uh, the uh, USB A or USB C to C female on the back there are so close together and these are quite chunky that there isn't really enough room to be able to do it. So I'm not exactly sure which one, uh, if I send this back, which one to get. So let's switch it on anyway and show you what happens with this just out of interest. So you can see that it powers up and it shows uh, the amount of usage. Unfortunately it's upside down but I can, I can flip that in the edit. Uh, and if I go to the display, it's basically restricting the amount of power going through and so we'll start to see the lightning bolt. It also means that boot is much slower so it's it's heavily compromised in this way so maybe I need to look at some other way of doing it um, but if I show you the device again just so you can see it out of interest but uh, it would be nice to see those things that use proper USB 3 uh, to be running at their full potential and maybe also be running them uh, sort of copying a long file or something and see uh, if that ramps up the amount of power. And this is maybe why devices are less reliable when you plug too many things into a Pi. Um, but also I found sometimes that USB boot doesn't work from USB 3, but it often works with USB 2 with uh, some operating systems that I'm having trouble with. Anyway, let's go back to that screen. You can see it definitely takes a lot longer to boot up because it's toggling itself back, because it hasn't got enough power. Yeah, eventually it starts up and I get mouse control, um, but uh, yeah, it's not working as it should. Anyway, I hope all this helps. Thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe.